Welcome to Unit 3. This will be Early Europe and the Colonial Americas. We're going to start in late antiquity and we're going to go all the way to the Baroque era, which is around 1600. So late antiquity is this sort of transition period between the latter half of the Roman Empire and the inception of Christianity. So it's kind of this this transition period between these two radically different Europes. So in the first century CE, Christianity is founded by Jesus Christ, who we'll talk about in a moment. And starting from around 100 to 300 CE, we're starting to see Christianity spreading from its point of origin um, over in the area by Jerusalem, and then spreading across Western Europe through missionary work. So missionaries are people <clears throat> that basically um, spread religion outward from a single point of origin. So um, there was also Christianity happening in Rome proper um, through underground churches, but they had to be very careful. Early Christians were heavily persecuted by the Romans and had to do all of this work in secret. So for a long period of its early history, Christianity was quite literally an underground religion. So um, one of the things that Christianity uses very frequently is narrative art. So these are artworks that tell a story. And oftentimes narrative art is telling these events described in the Bible, usually the New Testament. And it's also depicting these biblical figures largely in their own image. So the historical figure of Jesus Christ probably looked like this. He was brown. However, when we look at a lot of images in the United States of Jesus Christ, or at least in kind of in more of the like Western European world, we oftentimes see him as this like um, brown haired, blue eyed, very light skinned dude. Um, and this is very much kind of like this, this visual culture around Jesus that is that he's portrayed in such a way that he is identifiable to the people who are following him. So when you go to certain parts of Africa, for example, you'll see Jesus with Afro textured hair and dark skin. So that's why that happens. And we're going to be talking about that a little bit more later, how Jesus is depicted at various times and in different places. So around 310 CE, we see Emperor Constantine founding the city of Constantinople, uh, which was before that it, um, Byzantium and is now Istanbul, and basically laid the groundwork for Christianity Christianity becoming the primary state religion. So we're going to be talking about the Byzantine Empire next class. So I just wanted to provide some maps to give you a sense of what is happening in Western Europe during the late antique period. So around 125 um, CE, um, the Roman Empire is still pretty vast and extensive. Um, this is only a couple of years after Trajan's absolute uh, coverage of most of the ancient Mediterranean in the Roman Empire. And then after that, it's starting to become smaller. So Christianity is or originating right around here, and then it's spreading outward. The Roman Empire is starting to shrink a little bit more, especially um, in the Holy Lands. Um, and then we're also seeing it pop up in Western Europe here as well. And then the Roman Empire is shrinking even further. And then by around 400 AD, the Byzantine Empire has been established um, with its center in Constantinople, which is modern day Istanbul in Turkey. And Christianity has very much kind of replaced and even expanded upon the territories that originally um, held under the Roman Empire. So um, there's a couple of things that students are required to understand and know um, as they pertain to the AP curriculum. Uh, as a disclaimer, this course is non-denominational. Um, I personally do not subscribe to any religion or theological belief myself, um, but the way that the AP curriculum is structured um, really heavily favors Christian artworks. Um, so it's helpful to know certain um, events that are described in the Bible, specifically um, events that are in the New Testament that pertain to Jesus's life. So um, for those of you who don't know, Jesus Christ, who was basically like the founder of Christianity, was um, regarded in the Bible as the Son of God, 
born to Mary and Joseph. So the story of Jesus actually begins before his birth when Mary is like chilling out and doing stuff. And this angel appears out of nowhere. His name is Gabriel. And he basically says, uh, you're going to be pregnant with the son of God. And she's like, okay, let it be with me. I consent to this. So this is oftentimes referred to as the Annunciation. So you see this event depicted a lot in art. You oftentimes just see Mary like chilling out. Usually she's reading or she's doing something else. And then there's like a, um, an angel just like in her house. And there's obviously a conversation happening between them. So shortly after this, Mary and her cousin Elizabeth celebrate their pet pregnancies in this event that's known as the Visitation. So Elizabeth is pregnant with St. John the Baptist, who will come up later. So the Nativity or Christmas is this event where Jesus is born in Bethlehem. Um, you might recall a lot of these nativity scenes that you might have done in um, Bible school or elementary school. Basically, um, Joseph and Mary are walking around like trying to find a place to have their baby and they end up having him in a, a barn. So um, scenes with Mary and the baby Jesus are frequently referred to as virgin and child images or the Madonna and child image. We'll be seeing a lot of those as well. So shortly after this, we have these three kings that are giving gifts to baby Jesus and basically doting over him. Basically, like they see the star appear in the sky and they're like, oh, a new king has been born. So they go and they give him all sorts of fun stuff like spices and aromatics. So this is something that's oftentimes called the Adoration of the Magi. So um, skip forward a few years, we have St. John the Baptist baptizing Jesus in the Jordan River, being the first person to be baptized. And then Jesus starts gathering followers. Um, this is oftentimes referred to as the calling of the apostles. Then Jesus is going around and performing miracles. He is making blind men see again. He's turning two loaves and a couple of fish into enough food for 500 people. He is raising the dead. So he's doing all this stuff that's basically convincing people like this dude is powerful um, and we should probably listen to him. So skip forward a little bit more. Um, of course, with attention comes resentment. Um, and plotting. Obviously, the Romans are like, hmm, this guy is undermining our power. We should get rid of him. So we have the betrayal of Judas. So Jesus senses his death and gives St. Peter the keys to heaven and establishes him as the first pope. So this is oftentimes called giving the keys. So whenever you say, see St. Peter in imagery, he's oftentimes holding keys, and that's why. So Jesus then transfigures himself into God before his apostles, and he's like, surprise, I'm the son of God. Um, and then we see Jesus basically entering Jerusalem, greeted by palm fronds. This event is oftentimes called Palm Sunday. And then he shares um, his last meal with his apostles um, and basically says, one of you is going to betray me. And all of the apostles, except for Judas, are like, Mm, I don't know who this is. So this is oftentimes called the Last Supper. After this point, Jesus is sentenced to death, tortured and executed by being nailed to a cross. This is called the crucifixion. Fun fact, crucifixion was a method of punishment used by the Romans even before this. It's particularly grisly and horrible. So um, Jesus is then removed from the cross, mourned, cleaned, and buried. This is called the lamentation and the deposition. The deposition specifically refers to the removal of Jesus's body from the cross. Um, there's lots of images um, as well of Mary holding Jesus's lifeless body, oftentimes in mourning. These are called pieta. We'll see a lot of these in art history as well. Um, so after a period of three days after Jesus is interred, he rises from the dead. This is called the resurrection. And then he goes to heaven, which is called the ascension. So all of the items that are highlighted will come up in AP artworks. So I suggest that you understand these, but I've included other things in between just to give you a sense of what's happening between these times to help you make sense of this if you are not already familiar with um, the New Testament of the Bible. So just to reiterate, like, I really don't have any religious denomination associated with my upbringing. This is the only exposure to Christianity I had as a child. The Beginner's Bible, 
which I read like basically all the other storybooks in my library. Um, Veggie Tales, which I didn't under, which I didn't realize was religious until I was a teenager, and I was very shocked. And then The Prince of Egypt, one of my favorite movies, which is usually aff- affiliated with Judaism. So um, I have a very simplified and like bare bones perception of Christianity. It is not intended to be offensive um, or overly simplistic. I'm kind of learning along with everybody in a lot of cases when it comes to Christianity. So please bear with me. So our first AP artwork of Unit 3 is the Catacomb of Priscilla. So I mentioned previously that um, the ancient Christians basically had to operate in secret um, because they were being persecuted by the Romans. So they were even... What was so interesting is that the Christians were even spreading Christianity and these beliefs within the capital of the Roman Empire, which is, of course, Rome. And they were doing it underground in these areas called the catacombs. So the catacombs were this series of tunnels and kind of underground pathways underneath the city of Rome that spanned for over 100 miles. So people don't really go down there unless they are burying someone. Um, So it was the perfect hiding place. And it was a perfect place to set up these first kind of underground churches. So the catacombs contain the tombs of several popes, particularly the early popes, as well as Christian martyrs. So oftentimes you'll see churches and chapels erected in places where Christians were martyred. So that means that they were killed for being Christian or they died for their beliefs in some way. And it's basically designated as a holy site and there's a church built there usually to honor them. So the poor um, were placed in loculi, which are these simple niches. Oftentimes you'll find the remains of several people in just one loculus or one niche, while the richer Christians were buried in cubicula or mortuary chapels in these very ornate sarcophagi that are very similar to the ones that we saw at the tail end of the Roman Empire. So this is the Greek chapel right here. One of the things that you'll immediately notice about the Greek chapel is the painting on the wall. It is very, very similar to the paintings that we know of that were found in the city of Pompeii. So it's this Pompeian style where there's lots of reds and yellows that are being used. Oftentimes there's these alternating motifs of squares and rectangles. And then in some areas you have kind of like more narrative paintings that are describing a particular event. Um, It's kind of difficult to perceive in this image, but the painting is not super refined. When we look at the house of um, Fawn or we look at the house of the Vedi, for example, which are two houses in Pompeii, it is very obvious to art historians that the people who created these murals had access to lots of wealth because the paintings are of very high quality. However, um, the underground Christian religion was not particularly wealthy, um, so they had to kind of rely on what they had. You also have to imagine that there's not a lot of natural light down here, so it's going to be a little bit more difficult to paint. So it's um, not as high of a quality as something that you might have been, um, you might have seen in ancient, like an ancient Roman house of a rich person. So this is suggesting that the resources are limited. So inside the Greek chapel, it's called the Greek chapel because the inscriptions on the wall are in Greek. So this was the like, quote unquote, street language of Rome. Um, Not too many people in Rome proper actually spoke Latin. That was mostly a language that was spoken by the um, aristocrats um, and members of the ruling class, uh, whereas Greek was a lot more common and widespread. So these are some examples of early Christian sarcophagi. You'll notice that they're very similar in form to the Ludovisi battle sarcophagus that we saw last unit right here, where we have these figures that are grouped in large numbers, tightly packed together. Oftentimes the proportions are not entirely naturalized. So we're seeing a lot of these traditions from like the late Roman Empire carrying over into early Christian art. And if you're familiar with um, the New Testament in particular, in some parts of the Old Testament, you can see some of these narratives playing out. So we have the adoration of the Magi here. Here's Mary and Jesus and the three kings who are giving him stuff. And then there's a couple of narratives down here of different events from the Bible. I think this is David and the lions. And then we have Adam and Eve right here. 
So there's a couple of other things within the Catacombs of Priscilla that you should know. Um, this is the Orantz fresco, which is so named for this figure who is in an orating position. So he has his hands outstretched as if he's speaking. So he's an orator. So this is located over a family tomb niche and it's painted to fit into the arch of the wall. So this is very similar to the tympanum relief sculptures um, or not the tympan, the um, pediment relief sculptures that we're seeing in ancient Greek and ancient Roman artwork where the figures are kind of squeezed to fit into these dimensions here. So the figure in the center is standing, whereas the figures on the left and right are either sitting or they're children, so they're going to be smaller. Um, and they're also painted in such a way that they're in high contrast and they're standing out from the um, surface of the wall. So um, on the left, we have a teacher with children, and on the right, we have a woman and her child. This could possibly be Mary and Jesus, but scholars are not entirely sure. This is the Good Shepherd fresco right here. So this was another fresco that was found in the catacombs of the Priscilla. Um, here is one of those um, loculi niches right here. You can actually see the human remains. You can see a couple of skulls and a femur or two. Um, so that a lot of the human remains are actually still there. So this is the Good Shepherd fresco, and it depicts Christ in a more frugal pastoral setting as a shepherd. So you've probably heard um, this refrain, like, Christ is the Good Shepherd. So that's oftentimes referring to the fact that, like, he, he thinks of his followers as a flock of sheep, and that they sometimes wander astray, and then the shepherd kind of brings everybody back into the flock. Um, the, the story is depicted in lunettes. So lunettes are these half moon shaped um, niches that go around the central image. And these oftentimes depict events from the Old Testament, including Jonah and the whale, which I will talk about a little bit later. So again, we're seeing these elements of narratives that are being placed inside of these locations. Okay. So there's going to be a lot of architecture vocabulary in this unit, and I want to introduce it to you sooner rather than later, but not completely overload you. So we have two different church plans that we talk about um, in this unit, and then there's also like a hybrid of the two that we'll talk about later when we get to Hagia Sophia. So this is an axial plan. So you've seen the word axial plan before, um, referring to items like the um, Temple of Amun-Ron Hypostel Hall. So that basically is referring to there's one central axis going straight up and down, and things are relatively symmetrical on both sides of the axis. Okay, so here's the axis going this way. So I have highlighted the words that you should definitely know for AP Art History when it comes to church um, architecture vocabulary. So the entrance of the church is referred to as the narthex. When you enter past the narthex, you get into the main body of the church. Um, this central um, column right here that leads to the um, apse is called the nave. And then there's oftentimes two smaller columns that are flanking the nave, and these are called aisles or side aisles. When we look at um, basilica plan churches that are early in the curriculum, you will not see transepts as often. Um, but as we move forward um, in um, the history of Christianity, you start seeing churches incorporate transepts, which are these um, areas of the church that are created to um, manifest a more cruciform shape to the church. You'll notice what's super convenient is that these churches are oftentimes shaped like a cross, which is a, um, a, a, a motif that is heavily associated with Christianity because of the crucifixion. So oftentimes um, the sermon is happening in this area right here. Oftentimes this is where the lectern and the pulpit are. These are not particularly um, significant terms when it comes to art history. Um, and then there is the apse, which contains the altar. So this is kind of like the terminal end of the church right here. So this is our next work. This is Santa Sabina. And this is an axially planned church, um, but you'll notice that it does not have transepts. There's kind of like these two areas right here that are kind of like vestigial transepts, but they're not quite there. Um, what you'll notice about Santa Sabina is that it's very long. Um, 
and resembles the Basilica Ulpia that we saw in the form of Trajan. So this was very intentional. Again, a lot of motifs from the from ancient Rome were carried over into early Christian artwork in particular, um, because like why we reinvent the wheel if we don't have to. So we see Christians adapting the Roman Basilica, this long hallway with side aisles, as we see right here, into this um, congregational building that is used for worship. So this is an axial plan. The nave is serving as the primary fixture of the building. So that's again, the central column right here. What's interesting is that the columns that are between the nave and the side aisles, you'll notice that they're Corinthian. So these columns were actually stolen from the Temple of Juno, which was in this particular location uh, prior to the construction of this church. So they basically just took them and stuck them in the new building. So this is this actually happens a lot where a group will come in and they'll see stuff from an old monument or like an old fixture and they'll be like, it's free real estate, right? It's free real estate. So they basically take those things from the old building and incorporate them into the new. Again, why reinvent the wheel if we already have columns made, right? So this is called spolia. It's basically a fancy word meaning recycling. You'll notice that the roof of this building um, has a flat coffered ceiling. So remember, coffers are those little niches that are carved out to reduce the weight of the ceiling. We saw them in the Parthenon. The walls of the basilica are also relatively thin. They're just thick enough to support the weight of the roof. This is a very moderately sized church. Um, they start off very small, and then as we progress, especially to the Gothic era, they get massive. And it's at that point where we get cathedrals and the interiors are very dark and the walls are very high. But for the purposes of this kind of construction where you're not building very tall, the walls don't need to be very thick. So in terms of how congregation would happen, basically the men were allowed to convene in the nave and then the women were um, relegated to the side aisles. So um, congregations and worship um, were very oftentimes segregated by gender. 